Hello. Good morning. Good, good, good afternoon and good evening to everybody. How are you? Uh, thank you for joining uh, part three of this webinar series, Making Extension Outreach Trainings Gender Sensitive. Um, I want to start today by thanking the Ingenious team for, for hosting this with the appropriate scale mechanization consortium. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Tim Rendell. I'm the project manager of the appropriate scale mechanization consortium. And with me are Maria Jones and Axon from, from the ingenious team. And here, and now we have our picture. Sorry about that. Took a while to, for them to come up. Um, and Axon Mazwana from the, the ingenious team. Um, I'm very fortunate to be able to co-facilitate this webinar with them today. And I also want to thank Andrea Bowen, Deputy Director of Ingenious, for, for being with us for the past three webinars and helping us um, develop this and make this a reality. So please feel free to start tap, uh, typing in the chat box. If you've been on the webinars before, you know they're fairly interactive with the chat box, and we appreciate everybody who's able to contribute there. Um, so this is this is part three. Um, part one, we discussed the basics of effective training. Part two, we discussed how to train the right people. And today we're going to talk about great facilitation um, and how, how to really make a training event worthwhile for the participants. Um, but to recap from webinar one, um, we, we held, we talked about two tip sheets there um, and the tip sheets are available in the reference sections of all the slides that have been shared. Uh, tip sheet one, basics of effective training. Uh, we discussed how to make gender responsive training events fun. Um, make sure that the community and different trainees are there and having a worthwhile experience within your training event. Um, how to create leadership and decision-making opportunities for women within the training event. Um, it's a great way to start to break down some of those barriers that women's face and give them the, the power to start having leadership roles and decision-making opportunities, and that can move from trainings into daily life. Treat women and well as men as teachers and innovators. We don't want to think of this as a, a one-way street of information going from the facilitator to the trainee, but it's really learning and, and developing together. Um, and the final uh, tip for basics of effective training was walk your talk. You know, it's easy to say these things and it's another to put them into action. So really making sure that you're practicing what you preach and, and showing a good example to the trainees based for gender sensitive approaches. Um, tip sheet number two is great content. Um, so how to create great, great content, uh, collect relevant information prior to the training. Uh, make sure that you're training on the right items. Um, promote technologies uh, and practices menus rather than packages. Give the trainees choices on how they want to approach different issues. Um, and promote adaptive capacity, this, this idea that they're willing to experiment and learn together and adapt to, to changing uh, environments. Uh, recap from webinar two, we're gonna start with great training approaches. Um, and, and ensure training methodology is right for the participants, making sure that the level of the training is appropriate for the, the education levels of the trainees, the, um, the professions of the trainees or different social standings of the trainees. Um, mind your language. Uh, it's very powerful to make sure that everybody is able to understand what is going on. So, holding the trainings in the, the local languages as opposed to an international language or, an, or a national language that is not spoken by everybody and having translations um, available. Uh, create a respectful atmosphere within the training, uh, making sure that it's a safe space for people to speak their mind and, and share ideas. Um, promote flat learning and knowledge sharing structures. Foster positive interactions and use ICTs, film and media. So those are some great training approaches. Uh, tip sheet four was getting the right people to come. Um, set targets for women participation. And this isn't only getting women in the training, but also getting them engaged in the training and, and learning from the training. Uh, get technology users and end decision makers, end users of that 
training technology, the technology you're training on in the training. If we're doing a training for a post-harvest operation and it's only male heads of households, but the, the female um, is doing all the post-harvest operations, well, we wanna make sure that they're engaged with that training. Uh, and use the training event as a change mechanism. So that making sure that they're seeing this training event as an opportunity to, to change uh, some of the cultural barriers that w women face. Uh, final tip was making sure the right people can come. So it's one thing to, to see, okay, these are who we need to come to our training, but we need to make sure that they can come. So get the timing right. Making sure we're holding the training at a time of the day that they are able to attend. You know, if we hold morning trainings, it might be difficult for females to join based on their different household chores that are their responsibility. Uh, get the budget right. Making sure that it's, it's affordable for everyone to join and making sure that they're not having restrictions based on their ability to join. Um, so that was a recap of webinar one and two. The slides are available. If you don't have the slides, please feel free to email me and I'll make sure that you get a copy. Um, we'll also make all of the slides and content and videos available uh, online. Those will be available next week and we'll be sure to send out an email letting you know that they are available online. Um, with that notes, please, if you have questions, feel free to write them into the chat box. But we're gonna move on to the Today's webinar's content. Um, today we'll be discussing three different tip sheets and um, providing information on them. The first tip sheet is creating a supportive community. Uh, second tip sheet is getting great facilitators. And third tip sheet is after the training. Um, so I'm gonna invite Mar Maria Jones to come and speak about the first tip sheet, um, creating a supportive community. Thank you, Tim. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really glad to be here again, and thank you for joining us on this webinar today. I wanted to get us started off by asking a question, um, and please respond to this question in the chat box uh, that you should have on Zoom if you have logged in via email or the link that was provided. Uh, the question is, how have you gained community support to engage men in your events? As we know, this is quite hard, right? Especially, um, um, I, and specifically here, I'm talking about like gender sensitivity training. And if you've tried to, um, um, if you've tried to like have more men engage in your gender training, how have you engaged men in your gender training events and how have you gained community support? Feel free to put this in the chat box. We'll just start reading a couple of um, comments out. Um, I think we just had a first question. Can you elaborate on the question? You know what? I'll be honest. I realize this question does not make the sense that I thought it did <laughs> when I made the slides. Um, so, Circle, what I'm trying to say is um, gender trainings are usually difficult, and gender trainings are really hard when you're trying to engage men in them. So how in the past have you engaged men in your gender training? And that's what I wanted to get out of this question. So we had a first response from Tim um, who said household methodologies, which is really good. Um, just for those of you who um, are um, new to that, please do check out household methodologies, which takes both men and women into account when doing gender sensitivity trainings. Wow, Shahana has an interesting comment saying she did not find any difficulties to engage men, right? so they enjoy it. That's fantastic. That is a very unique situation there by the sound of it. Axon just mentioned inviting men um, to support their spouses in the different training events. That's also good. 
if men are willing to come, right, Axon? Sir Carl had a good point that if you want to engage men and women, you need to provide some sort of support, um, whether it's transportation or money to implement, like small grants to implement what they have learned. That's a very good point. So sort of creating that support system around. And finally, we have um, a response from Paula, who mentions that, um, that it's so important to communicate that this is a joint effort, not a separate effort, and um, specifically like giving examples of the economical benefits. Uh, we also have another final comment from Rachada uh, uh, by saying that it's important to title and advertise the training that the gen that um, gender is about both men and women. That's such a good point because often we have found that people usually think gender is a, a woman thing, but it's really not. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the comments. I think it's very helpful. And thank you for going with the flow of answering these questions. And we'll just jump straight in. So how do we create a supportive community, um, especially engaging both men and women in gender transformative approaches because this does play a role into how well your technologies are adopted or your training approaches are adopted. So coming into that, uh, there are three ways you can think about this. The first is to engage community and build support. The second is to build on existing gender norms. And number three, support men and boys. So building a supportive community um, or building community appreciation. Um, as I had mentioned before, in order for gender transformation to take place, we need to create an enabling environment. Without this enabling environment, a lot of the individual efforts that we try to implement will not work. So how do you build this enabling environment? Some of the um, practical, specific ways you could do this is by first ensuring there's support for women's participation. Um, have you tried sensitizing the community in advance of the event? or talking about women's participation. Here is where it's so important to talk with community leaders and opinion formers, um, including male household heads or relatives. Um, in Bangladesh, I know we have found it very useful uh, in getting adoption of better nutrition practices amongst young mothers by talking to mother-in-laws who are a part of the extended family. So these are the sort of things that you want to be thinking about as to who are people who are opinion formers, who can make change happen, community leaders, even if it's male household heads, how can we engage them more in women's participation and training events? Um, another tip is to go farm to farm to secure engagement of women. Uh, and be ready to address questions. You will <laughs> rest assured if you go farm to farm to engage uh, women, you will have questions coming from different angles as to why the women should be involved. So if you are conducting a training event that you would like women to be a part of, be ready to address these questions and concerns. It might be with safety, it might be with location, it might be with transportation, but these are the sort of things that you need to be thinking about. And also reach out to women via various social networks. Women, um, the social network is the offline social network, unless people are on WhatsApp, which many people are. But think about religious social networks or school-related social networks, sports, um, if there are sports groups, savings groups, VSLAs, um, different sorts of groups that exist. Engage women via these various existing social networks. It's a great way to reach them. Um, also, along with building community appreciation and support, um, I think as you are talking to community members, as you're engaging men and women in encouraging women to attend your trainings, it is important to determine if women will be trained together with men or separately because people will ask you this question. Now, personally, there are pros and cons to both. I don't think either of the methods are absolutely perfect. If you train um, women and men separately, um, there's usually a risk of creating this them versus us feeling uh, where you end up element, where you continue to 
um, encourage the um, division of men versus women in what they do and how they do it. However, we all know those of us who have been in trainings or even as we put men and women into smaller groups, women are more willing to speak when they're in a smaller group where men are not engaged or women are willing to um, voice opinions that they may not have been confident to voice uh, with their husbands around or with their bosses around. So do think about your context as to what works best for you um, and work with it for your specific situation. And also, as I had mentioned earlier, it's very important to identify time, mobility, and other constraints that may limit women's participation. It is fine if you can go farm to farm and invite women farmers to attend your training, but if you don't take care of basics of how will they get to that training location, what time it's being held at, like how Tim had mentioned earlier, you can't have it in the morning when women are engaged in their activities. So think about time, think about mobility, think about other constraints and how your training will address those constraints to ensure you have maximum women's participation. Um, and just a note, we did mention this in a little bit more detail in webinar two, specifically under the tip of making sure the right people can come. And we will, as Tim had mentioned, be sharing these slides out if some of you are here for the first time today. Um, the next point is, how do you build on existing gender norms? Um, it is hard to break a stereotype if you don't start with where they're at first. Um, the first tip is to develop training activities that foster reflection in action around gendered attitudes and practices. An example I will give to explain this is the activity that Ingenious has done through the introductory gender and nutrition training. This is a two and a half day, highly participatory interactive training that, um, that uses no PowerPoints. In fact, sometimes we follow the no PowerPoint training. And it is, it's based on adult learning principles. And what we do is we start on um, existing gender attitudes and practices, and it's completely activity oriented. And all of the activities are, are um, uh, they are designed in a way by which people reflect at the end of the activity and they think about the gender norms and the attitudes. It's, we don't tell them this is how you should be treating women or this is how you should gain more women participation, but we get them to reflect on it by involving them in activities. And if you're interested to see what these activities are, I will be talking about an example in just in a couple of seconds, but also feel free to check out a reference slide where I have attached the manual on how you can do this yourself. The next point, use games and then draw learning related to these gender norms uh, expressed in these games. Um, a really cool game that one of our colleagues, Amber Martin had developed based on existing research was called the Veil of Ignorance, which allows people to really discuss what their lives would be like if they were completely uh, different gender, different age, different location, um, whether they had children or no children. The game definitely draws a lot of laughs, especially if you can see in that image where this guy got female and youth. Um, but it's while it makes people laugh, it also makes them think, what would their lives be like if he was a female youth in maybe a rural area versus where he is right now? Uh, so these are the sort of games you want to be thinking about. Um, another thing to think about is role plays. Role plays are fantastic to, in a very subtle way, to get out what existing gender norms are and play on them and talk about them. Next, build capacity of women, uh, especially young women, on their participation, leadership skills, and potential. This is what I had mentioned about with the introductory gender and nutrition training that Ingenious does. And specifically, this image is from the activity on who eats what, where we are trying to get to the objective of helping people understand that what they eat depends on what their gender is and what their age is. Uh, technically, a younger child should be getting more food, but children do not tend to get food, um, especially based on cultural norms the women, the woman, especially the wife, barely eats, whereas the husband is seen as the one who is a head of the household who has to have the majority of the food on the plate. Uh, a way we try to do this activity, though not in this picture, um, 
is usually we try to switch the genders. Usually we try to give the wife's role to a man or we try to give a daughter's role to a young man. And we like to give women the role of the husband and really, again, discuss, especially as they go through this process of how does it feel to get less food, more food? How does it feel to be prioritized or not prioritized in the family? Support men and boys. Um, in building community around gender sensitivity trainings or in being more gender sensitive in your trainings, it is important to support men and boys in this initiative. The first thing you should be doing is to challenge the perceptions of men and boys, especially around who does what, who's responsible and who's benefiting. It's also important to strengthen men's personal commitment, equipping them with the knowledge and skills to put their commitment into practice. Consider ways to support men as they begin to question culture, whether at home, community, work, media, all of which that shape their identities. And finally, do create men-only groups and help men support each other where they can challenge practices, um, especially with traditional ways of what it means to be a man. Now, I will be honest. When I read this, it is hard. I come from a very patriarchal society myself. I am from India. And with a lot of the work that we do, especially around gender work in different parts of the world, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, um, I realize how many similar similarities exist between patriarchal cultures. And a lot of times, including men and boys in gender sensitivity trainings, um, I think the reaction is quite the opposite where uh, men laugh it off. They don't think it's that important. They think it's fuzzy. It's a woman's thing. And even if people are highly educated, when it comes to their households, um, their actions do not really change. And it is important to think about how can we, um, we may not be able to save the world. <laughs> we may not be able to change every single thing around us. But I do think we can start sowing the seeds of change because that's how change does happen across communities and across time and across countries and societies. A really good resource for how to engage men in this whole um, uh, journey towards gender equity is uh, ICRU, which is ICRW, recently came up with a paper called Gender Equity and Male Engagement. It's definitely worth a read, especially their brief on how to engage more men in this journey of gender equity. And they had a really good quote, recognize how social norms of power and gender affect both men and women as individuals in the relationships with each other and in the structures and institutions that organize societies. Um, and I think what they're trying to get at is the fact that negative, um, negative gender norms or patriarchal culture is not just harmful to women, it's also harmful to men. And helping men understand that is a starting point. And they also had some specific tips such as in your messaging to men, avoid the zero sum messaging. Uh, a lot of times men think that if you take power and give it to uh, a woman that they, I mean, let me rephrase that, that if you are um, vouching for equal power or equal decision making, men feel that power is being taken from them and given to women. But however, that's not the case, um, or maybe in a way it is the case. But Either way, in your messaging, try to avoid that zero-sum messaging uh, where it feels like they're losing out while women are gaining. The reality is they're not losing out. Um, focus on gender transformation than just gender sensitization. Ge gender transformation is more sustainable and like what uh, I think one of the comments had mentioned about household methodologies also is gender transformative. Start young. Um, Young men have a huge role to play, and they are um, ahead of uh, most of the older generation in how they view women and how they want their families to be like. So start young, uh, start with the youth. The youth are what creates change. And finally, use male role models and leaders. It is important to have the support of the community, like we had mentioned, and how you can do this is by having male role models and leaders who support you in this perspective. So just to summarize really quickly, uh, you can create a supportive community by first engaging the community and building support. Um, next, you build on existing gender norms. And finally, support men and boys.
And with that, I'm going to pass this off back to Tim. Uh, thanks so much, Maria. It's, it's always invigorating to hear you speak on, on these um, topics. I always learn something new. So, so thank you for all your efforts. Uh, so we'll, we'll start with a, a question for, for all the participants. And please write your answer in, in the text box. Uh, when was the last time you attended a, a training facilitated by a woman? And I'm going to add to that question or, or just have you start thinking about what qualities did that trainer have that made them an effective trainer or what, what, could they, what qualities could they have built upon to be a more effective trainer? Two years ago from Circle, so sometime, I think mine was about last month, um, I, I had a training facilitated uh, by a woman and it was one of the best trainings I've ever attended in my life and I've, I've been using all of the different information I learned in that training just about every day since, so it was a very empowering training for me. Andrea mentioned she's impressed with how many women are working as facilitators. Two days ago, um, and, and she she was listening to our concerns. That's a that's a good point of of good facilitation. So I'm gonna please feel free to keep answering in the text box. I'm gonna move forward um, discussing getting great facilitators. Um, so the the quick outline is get great facilitators. Women can do technology too. Go local. Develop women facilitators and support women facilitators. But I'll I'll keep going. So what makes uh, gender sensitive facilitation great. Um, a participatory bottom up development process. This is something we have been trying to say in every single webinar is how, how, do, how do we make training events fun, participatory, and really a learning event for all the attendees um, in a bottom up process. Uh, next item is enthusiasm. It's always much more fun to be in a training with a enthusiastic trainer, somebody who really shows you how fun um, the training could be and it really sets the stage for the whole training when you have somebody who is excited to be there. Uh, conviction um, goes with enthusiasm, uh, really a belief that the training has the ability to be an agent of change. Somebody that's walking their talk and shows that they believe in what they're saying. Um, commitment and being committed to an open and open dialogue and learning based on respect and understanding, being, being a good listener um, and being able to pull out conversations that are, that are hiding beneath the surface. Um, and, and as I already mentioned, walk the talk, re really showing that they're, they're there to sh be an example for the community. So, so male facilitators should realize the virtues that are bestowed upon them by gender and be willing to, to reject some of these benefits to be more closer to, to gender equity and show that as an example to the rest of um, the attendees that you know just because a male facilitator does has this benefit doesn't mean that women shouldn't have the benefit too and, and they can bring light to that situation. Um, and walk the talk, female facilitators should be able to listen to the males um, and, and constructively challenge them when appropriate. So really making sure that it's a, a, a benefit opportunity for both males and females that are being trained and really showing us an example of how we can start to look at these gender norms and talk about them and open a dialogue around them together. Um, great, great facilitation should be able to diagnose gender related issues um, and really realize where the, the crux of the issue is or the crux of the problem and be able to start conversation around it. Um, facilitate women's participation, ensure that women are able to implement the technologies and innovate afterwards. Um, not just focusing on the participants that are really enthusiastic to join and learn, but make sure that all of the participants are, are getting a chance to engage and learn. Um, many times what you'll see is you'll have 
a few trainees that are really excited, um, which is great, but we wanna make sure that they're not taking away from, the, from all of the, the entire group by being the ones that are always practicing with the technologies or providing their, their input. We wanna make sure that we're, we're giving an opportunity to all. Um, understand the culture. Uh, th this is an important one. Um, you know, in some cultural settings, uh, women-only training may be, may be more effective. Um, we should aim to have a gender balance in trainers so we can look um, at a, a male and female team and show communities that maybe are more segregated that there shouldn't be taboos around males and females working together and they can work together effectively. Um, but understanding if there, there is a heavy sense of segregation between male and female in the culture that maybe you do have to start with women-only and men only sessions, and then you can build them up to, to working together. Um, but understanding the cultures is, is very important when you're looking at, at a training session. Um, other ways to have great facilitation is to partner with other gender transformative groups. You know, there, are, there may be other NGOs or other projects within the same area that are also working on being gender transformative. So if you partner with them and, and work with them, you can, you can baby, basically double your reach and, and have more minds working on the same issue. It, it really amplifies your ability to create change. Um, and ensure a diverse representation of different social groups and, and encourage peer trainers, mobilizers, and facilitators. Uh, making sure that the community is represented well and it's not just a single type of representation. Okay, so those are some qualities of great facilitators. They are not comprehensive and I'm sure there are more. Please feel free to type some in the chat box if I missed any. I, I do not believe I named them all. Those were just a few that were, were available. Um, but now we're gonna discuss how to get great facilitators um, and, and make sure your, your program works well. So uh, first tip would be to develop a cohort of excellent women and men facilitators that are able to allow women to participate actively. Um, right now we've written down aim towards at least 50% women trainers, um, really show that men and women can train together. And even if, let's say we have 50% trainers, we wanna make sure that they're, they're equally involved. So if, oh, if we don't want a woman trainer just standing in the back to be a woman trainer. We wanna make sure that she's actively training, she's actively provide, providing guidance and showing that the men and women are, are working together equitable. How to get great facilitators. Uh, pair less experienced facilitators with more seasoned facilitators. So this, this allows them the experience to learn from somebody who already has the experience. Um, allows them to share t experiences and techniques and um, gain this, this opportunity and gain this experience related to facilitators. Um, I know every time I see a facilitator I like, I try to see different qualities they have and maybe try to replicate them later. And, and it's always about learning and, and bettering yourself and giving young trainers the opportunity to better themselves with great examples is a great way to start great facilitators for your program and for the future. Uh, train facilitators and techniques to help women speak. So encourage men to respect women's views and give them space to talk. This is a, this is a great opportunity and a great skill for a facilitator to have. Um, some of the best trainings that I've been a part of, the facilitator did very little speaking. A lot of what came out was actually from the participants and really listening, understanding, and being able to constructively take these dialogues and put them into a larger frame for the participants and facilitate that conversation and making sure it always comes back and, it, and does have some structure so it's valuable and, and a learning experience. And, and that's a very empowering way to facilitate different um, attendees or different trainees. So, sorry, just a little bit of a delay changing that slide. Um, show that women can do the technologies as well. Um, pair women and men's staff to lead community introductions and training events. Um, recruit women and technical staff to teach on traditionally male dominant topics such as pesticide applications, pruning. So in this situation, I, I, I want to highlight Shahana Begum. She is our gender specialist for the appropriate scale mechanization innovation hub in Burkina or in, in Bangladesh, excuse me. And, and we have pictures of her here with female farmers learning to use different mechanization. 
Um, and she's really been a great example of how to show that women can do the technology too. So Shahana, I just wanted to, to take this opportunity to thank you in the webinar because you've been, you've been wonderful and you've been participating great over the last three webinars and we, we really appreciate it. So I have videos here. This is a, a rice reaper in Bangladesh and I hope the, the video isn't too choppy for you. But you'll see we, we have opportunities for female farmers to actually work firsthand with the technology, which are generally dominated by males. So it, it's a, within the community, it's really starting to show that women are able to do this and it doesn't have to be a male dominated space. Um, so that was a rice reaper and here's a, here's a mini combine harvester that we're also working with in Bangladesh. And here's another female farmer operating. So it's really starting to show that they are capable and they are able to do this. And we really thank you for, for the help with that, Shahana. It's really a, a great, great thing that you're doing. Uh, go local, uh, develop the skills in the community to conduct training. So I, wanna, I want us to look back to webinar one uh, in the basics of effective training. Andrea provided an example with the story of asthma. Um, she was a trainee who was very enthusiastic for one of the trainees and, and after they left, she, she took what she learned in that training and started to become a voice in the community and started holding trainings herself. You know, at the beginning, they can shadow experience the trainers and the events and be giving small responsibilities and you can start to build their skills to more and more responsibilities to the point that they're able to hold the training all by themselves. Um, and, and it's really building that skill within the local communities to be agents of change for their communities. Uh, develop women f facilitators. It's important to realize that women participants may feel more open with a women trainer. Um, it, it opens up a, a more honest and open dialogue. Women will be more willing to ask questions, more willing to answer questions, admit to knowledge gaps. So if we can start developing more women trainers, that, that shows a great benefit and you're able to reach more participants at a deeper level. Um, than just a male facilitator trying to, to speak to women trainers because there are going to be some differences and, and women trainers will be more cognizant of those differences. And, and then we still can learn and we need to, to better ourselves on terms of being able to reach women participants and understand the differences. But um, there, there is still comfort in a women to women um, exchange. Uh, men may, in, in the community may prefer to have their wives to have a female trainers. And if, if that's the case in the community, it, we can ensure women only groups and have them facilitated by women facilitators, uh, which we discussed earlier as, as a good way to understand the culture that you're working in and understand what's appropriate. So now that you're starting to develop women facilitators, how do you support them to make sure that they stay effective facilitators for you? Um, women facilitators may need specific support um, to be able to facilitate for you. Uh, looking back, the women facilitators will still have some household chores, so maybe we have to get the timing right for when the training so it's appropriate for them so they can still meet their other obligations. Um, that could be on-site. Also, we can look at having on-site childcare if they have young children, making sure we see the barriers that a female facilitator may have, that a male facilitator may not have, and how do we approach solutions for that. Um, ensure accommodation is safe with adequate sanitation, making sure that the location is appropriate for both male and female. Um, it, it's, it's very important to make sure that all training spaces are a place of respect and a place for participants to feel safe and feel comfortable. And if we are not doing that, then we're, we're not holding a training as effectively as we should be. Um, Encourage and support women to discuss their training experiences and any problems they may face which hamper their ability to work well. You know, as a male facilitator with a female facilitator, if you see, if you see a situation that is hampering the ability to work well, we, as a male facilitator, you may have an opportunity to step in and help in that situation because of the virtue of your, your gender and the cultural norm. I mean, being able to understand that you can support these women by giving them a voice um, and, and really making sure that their, their voice is heard throughout the, the training. So to recap, um, getting great facilitators, um, developing a cohort of facilitators and aim for about a 50-50 mix of male-female, 
Showing that women can use the technology as well is, is very important. Go local, develop, develop facilitators within the local community, make them agents for change at the community level. Um, develop women facilitators because they do have a, a, a great power to work within the female, with female farmers and, and, and open up honest discussion that might be more difficult for males to open up. And, and that when you're doing gender sensitive trainings, you really wanna open up those, those honest discussions related to gender. Um, and, and support women facilitators. Make sure that they have all they need to be effective um, and, and realize that there are different constraints between male and female facilitators and making sure that they, they're addressed equally. So please feel free to type any comments or questions in the chat box. Um, my portion of, of the, the presentation is done. I just wanna thank everybody for joining today, um, allowing us to speak. And I'm gonna pass, pass it over to, to Axon to speak about his portion of today's webinar. All right, thank you so much, Tim. Um, before we proceed, I'll just uh, ask you to answer the question that's provided. How do you keep in touch with participants from your training events? We can just type our responses in the chat box um, before we get started looking at this uh, tip sheet. How do we keep in touch with the participants from our training events? Uh, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. We're saying um, email, but that is not a suitable channel for rural trainees. Um, that's totally true. However, WhatsApp does work in more and uh, more places. Yeah, most of our rural participants uh, time and again just have a basic uh, phone or have a basic um, access to technology. So email might work in an event where we have, uh, say, in an urban setup. Um, Sako, I provide them my contact number and they call me whenever there is a problem of insect pests and diseases, also nutrition management in commercial vegetable crops. Yeah, phone calls as well as text messaging has been quite effective in most of our rural communities as uh, regards uh, keeping in touch uh, with our, our participants. Any other comments, you can keep them coming. Andrea says, oh, you go through a point of contact, someone whom you can reach by phone, text, WhatsApp, Skype, email, and ask her or him to touch base with the trainees in person and give feedback to, to you as the trainer. Well, that, that really works, especially in an event where, in the case where the participants, some of the participants do not even have access to cell phones. So we use a, a lead person or a contact person to, you know, to reach the people that we intend to reach. In addition to the above, we do field visits. Yes, uh, Annette Mlema. Then field visits, some of them are timely because sometimes we do not visit every week or as, as we would have desired due to other engagements. Sako, if they are well literate, they send the pick of diseased plant insects via Facebook also. And I can also recommend them to do from the, uh, the FB. From whatever information that you receive uh, through a picture, then you're able to, to advise on what to do. Well, keep the comments coming. Um, we'll proceed uh, looking at uh, this uh, great uh, uh, tip sheet. All right, and um, after the training, well, so we've empowered the uh, women, we've empowered the men, we've taken care of all the concerns uh, in the gender divide, and we've made sure that our trainings are gender sensitive, everything else is done. After the training, what do we do? How do we proceed going forward? Well, um, under this tip sheet, we'll look at four approaches. The first one being that we need to provide the refresher courses at set time periods to be able to keep people um, aloof, not for the information to be obsolete or whatever it is they know they would have forgotten, to be able to remind them of what needs to be done along the way. Then we develop our mentoring programs, then we keep updating our training event, as well as materials and replicate, replicating and scaling up uh, the uh, training event. And so we'll look at a case study where in Mali, um, the USAID, a mayor's program working hand in hand with uh, Winrock, 
has been working on, on the Farmer to Farmer program. Uh, where it links uh, are the experts. Uh, these are usually driven from or taken from the U.S. Uh, farming community or U.S. professional community and connect them with local farmers to provide technical assistance. But the, 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 this expert will be taken for, say, two weeks, 10 days to about 14 days to conduct a training in a specific technology that has been identified as a need area by the local people that are working on the ground. So Winrock personnel is identified to go into the community, identify the areas of need, and then link the experts to those organizations or to those farmers. And through this, the trainings will be conducted Time and again, repeat visits are organized by the organization, USID working with Winrock. Repeat visits are organized where the expert would have gone back, would have to go back into the field to see what progress has been made as uh, pertaining to the need area that was identified and the training that was conducted. And these repeat visits act as a refresher courses for people to be able to know what was, uh, what was communicated, what, was, what they were trending, as well as to keep them accountable of what uh, deliverables they have come up with uh, during the trainings. Because nothing gets done unless it has a targeted uh, uh, needy area to be sorted. And um, the other, as we go forward, as part of the technical uh, refresher, we need to ask participants how they have been adopting uh, the technologies that you have trained them in. Has there been any issues that have come up? Has, um, has there been any need areas that need to be assorted along the way so, as we, so that we'll be able to, to, keep in, to keep them in check on what uh, they would have agreed to deliver on? Have there been any special issues facing women, youth, and other groups? What can be done about them so that we keep rectifying the situation as we proceed? Then we build an interactive discussion on these processes will help improve on material training events as well as uh, technologically and become technologically and socially relevant. Well, it's not all the time that uh, everything that we have trained them will have to be delivered as you train them. Along the way, you need to keep uh, checking on your progress and see what, um, what really has uh, changed on, over time and what would need to be improved on. Then on developing mentorship and updating the material, we need to recognize community level experts such as older women that may be trained to mentor coach or young women, for example, on the technologies. It's, it has been noted that usually women relate to women better. And from the previous speakers, you, were, you heard that most of the time when we are conducting um, uh, trainings or when we are trying to empower the women, it always comes out better if it's a fellow woman that's addressing their need because they have the same perspective, they have the same understanding of the situation. And so if we are trying to build women, we are also trying to build the younger women, younger generation as target groups. So as we have this chain, continued chain of progress along the, the barriers to, to tackle the issues of barriers in the gender divide. And we need to keep, uh, keep updating our, our training, develop case studies or life stories of the adoption process to build into future training courses. Whatever it is that would have uh, uh, done what has worked, what seems to be appreciated by the community, by the participants, has to be recorded in form of uh, case studies or in form of uh, uh, stories that would have been developed. And that has to be communicated and passed on or stored for the other people that will appreciate and use our materials. Under this case, we look at uh, the Digital Green uh, India uh, program that's been working in Karnataka and Orissa and other states where the Digital Green has been working with uh, the idea of uh, developing community mediators in dealing with the social distance concerns. Because you know that uh, the farmer, uh, the extension officer farmer ratio has been quite low. And so Digital Green came in with the idea of empowering uh, women, women, and not only women, as well as men in the, in the communities to come up with community mediators. And these are the people that are used to conduct trainings in the field, as well as to collect data on what uh, issues uh, people need to be addressed. And this is used also to keep standards as well as for continuous improvement. Because along the way, as you are implementing uh, the technologies, then you are able to rectify all the issues that would have arisen. And the, throughout this program in the Digital Green uh, Framework, the mentorship is provided to the community mediators to train them as well as to keep them in check on what they are doing, as well as to encourage them on what needs to be done better or what they would improve on. It's like a two-way thing, like you use the participatory approach where you have bottom-up as well as top-down, where you work 
you, you have these interventions that are being developed by, by the experts, as well as you have input from the people that are implementing them on the ground. And this helps to keep women act active, to keep women involved, and your uh, women are engaged in the development uh, agenda. And so when we are looking at uh, replicating and scaling, we need to contribute to a multi-stakeholder learning platform. These have to be set up. Could be at district level, could be in the village level, could be in the block level. These have to be uh, set up. And these have to be looking at gender technology and share lessons learned on gender responsive and gender transformative methodologies. Not everything that we do is, has to stick with us as an organization or we have to know it as experts. If we know it and we don't use it, then there's no need. So we need to share every good practice that we've learned over time with our organization, with our partners and other stakeholders. We need to share it online. Uh, for example, through the, uh, the AgriLinks, they have uh, a, a rich base of uh, information online. Then talk about the most effective training events and explain why you think those worked really well. Then be confident to share failures to help understand what went wrong because whatever I would have done and has failed, other people might not know it if we don't share it, and they'll implement it the way we implemented it and failed. So it's like replicating failure in a way. And so everything, all the scores that we've recorded, all the failures or challenges recorded have to also be shared for people to appreciate. And it is through such a base or such knowledge, uh, knowledge sharing or such base or platforms that we've created that information pertaining to gender sensitive or gender responsive trainings and what really works on the ground will be appreciated. And so to sum up, what have we learned? What we have learned over time? After the training, after we've conducted the training, we've uh, uh, taken care of all the gender uh, concerns, all the norms, all the uh, traditional issues, all the time factors. We've addressed all the areas. What do we need to do? We need to provide refresher courses to set the time periods pertaining to the um, deliverables that we've, we've uh, agreed on with the participants, then develop mentoring programs to keep uh, the uh, content relevant and uh, keep updating our training events, as well as replicating and scaling the training event. Everything that we know and have uh, communicated, have uh, conducted the trainings in, has to be shared. At this point in time, I'll pass it on to Tim. Thanks, Axon. So, so we finished all the tip sheets, and I, and I hope you guys have, have learned and enjoyed uh, joining us for these webinars. Uh, these chip, tip sheets are available in the reference sections, and, and they will provide all the information that we've provided over the, the last three webinars. Um, the tip sheets include basics of effective training, great content, great training approaches, getting the right people to come, making sure the right people can come, creative a supportive community, getting great facilitators, and after the training. So with that, I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us for these three webinars. Um, it, it's really been a great opportunity for me to, to be able to share with you all and, and hold this webinar. I really appreciate Ingenious for, for helping develop this and giving me the opportunity to, to co-develop it with them. And, and thank you to the, the entire ASMC team and Ingenious team, and particularly the, the gender specialists that were able to join us. Um, and, and thank you, Shahana, Sarko, and others who were also active in the chat. So are there any questions for us? And, and we'd be happy to, to help answer. Oh, and, and I, I must note it's a happy birthday to Andrea. Andrea, thank you so much. And, and everybody here is wishing you a very happy birthday. Thank you, Shahana. Well, if, if there are any questions, we'll, we'll, we'll end the webinar series. Thank you all for joining. And, and if you do have questions that come up, please feel free to email me or Maria. We're more than happy to respond via email. Thank you all for joining, and we hope that you take these tips and start to implement them in your training sessions. 
Uh, next week, we will follow up with a, a link to all of the reference material online and to the, the recordings of the webinars will be posted online next week. We also follow up with a follow-up survey to get some feedback on what we did well and what we can be doing better because as facilitators, we always want to make sure we're, we're constantly improving and learning to, to better ourselves as well. So thank you all for joining. Please feel free to email any more questions and I hope to, to hear, speak with you and see you all soon.